uh, Professor Edgar Petersey. Uh, we're honored to have you with us. Uh, feel very welcomed. Uh, could you please uh, uh, start to uh, give us the situation, the current situation you're dealing with? I am so honored and, and, and privileged to be here today and to share with you some thoughts in this panel and to be part of a large and ongoing conversations amongst local authorities within the Swedish context. Um, I also want to just acknowledge that uh, there's been a long-standing relationship between the African Center for Cities uh, at the University of Cape Town, where I am based and work as the director, and various partners within the Swedish context, in particular through the Mr. Urban Futures program that ran over the last decade, and currently through a more direct engagement with the Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development. So it's this real pity that I can't be there in person, but it's wonderful still to be able to engage with you. So in my very brief time, I want to just provide a very, very quick snapshot on what COVID-19 and its urban impacts have meant in the African context and how this has, if you will, opened up an opportunity to think a lot more um, radically about the future of African cities and particularly the prospects of sustainable urban development. And so we are trying to use what is a once in a century disaster as an opportunity to hopefully rethink and to reposition a number of institutions across the continent. Now, of course, since the onset of COVID, we saw a significantly very quick responses from most African governments. Uh, this ranged from mitigation actions, uh, in particular working remotely and so forth, closing of universities and schools, uh, the banning of public gatherings and so forth, and uh, to containment measures as well, from quarantine to lockdown and so forth. Now, the net effect of this, of course, was profound. But the most important issue to recognize, and I want to contextualize this a little bit more, is the fact that the economy ground to a screeching halt during this period. And this, of course, represented a significant shift after almost 25 years of sustained growth. So this data set from the International Monetary Fund demonstrates that after most of the sort of from the 70s until the early 90s, African economies experienced extremely erratic GDP performance. And this, of course, was related to a number of factors, no least uh, poor governance and a tendency uh, for using the national fiscus for political pilfering. Stabilization started to set in in the early 90s, and we almost immediately started to see some of the developmental effects of that, at least through the indicator of GDP growth. And from about the mid-1990s onwards, we saw really robust and very substantial growth rates of well above 5% for more than a decade. And so this, of course, has fed a larger discourse around Africa's turnaround from a post-colonial uh, period of stagnation or erratic growth or uh, combined with poor governance. However, what we now see in the context of COVID is that growth has fallen off a cliff. And it's important to understand that the impacts of this is a lot more severe than in other contexts, particularly OECD context, where you have social protection measures, where you've got insurance facilities, where you've got a range of instruments, both in the public and the private sector, that can absorb some of the severity of the shocks and so forth. And so to drive this point home, I want to really underscore what this has meant for the informal economy and hopefully give you some sense of the scale and the severity of this. Now, across the continent, the vast majority of the labor force is in fact within the informal sector. And with the lockdowns and the various measures associated with both mitigating and containing COVID, these impacts were absolutely profound. Now, to understand what this meant, it's useful to just remind ourselves that outside of the global north, to use that term, or OECD countries, or upper middle income countries, informal employment, in fact, is the dominant condition. So we know that up to 70% of employment in the developing world, based on ILO data, is informal. In Africa, this number is higher. It's up to 
And this, of course, includes both urban and rural areas, and most employment in the agricultural sector, of course, is piecemeal and informal. But even within the urban areas where one would expect uh, a more modest share of informality, it is still above 60%. And the table on the right hand side just gives you some sense of a number of West African countries where this phenomenon is much higher uh, than what is the average across Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, it is profoundly gendered in that more women are represented in the sector. Now, the point about this is that it's not just the fact of informality, but it is that informality goes with wages that are substantially lower than formal employment but more perniciously, these are incomes that are precarious. So you don't know from the one day to the next, from the one month to the next, what the household can plan in terms of income. And this has a direct bearing in how you insert yourself within the city, within urban context. And so we know because of this context in most African cities, there is a symbiotic relationship between informal livelihoods, living in slum conditions, and at an aggregate level, a very significant and severe level of urban inequality. And what COVID has done, it has brought these pre-existing conditions to the fore, and it has demonstrated the extent to which our cities were, if you will, already designed to leave a large proportion of the population vulnerable, and that this was, of course, then simply exacerbated in the context of an economic freeze or an economic severe economic slowdown. So within this context and in the last five minutes, I just want to shift register and begin to speak to how we've used this crisis to enable and open up a new set of policy conversations about where our cities are going and how to rethink that. But this has got to be part of a larger frame around how we are dealing, of course, with a global conversation about what sustainable development might mean what a more inclusive society might mean, what a more tolerant society might mean. So practically speaking, the task that we are facing and what COVID is enabling us to talk about is the need for a practical vision to reimagine the very nature in terms of economic inclusion, but also questions of identity. How do you belong in the city? What, what does substantive citizenship mean? Um, and as this photograph demonstrates, of course, uh, this is precisely at the heart of what we've seen raging on the streets of Lagos over the last couple of days, echoing to some extent what is going on in Santiago in Chile and on the streets of Bangkok in Thailand as well. These are all questions of political and cultural and social belonging in cities and societies that have for a very long period told young people that there is no future for you in the city because there's no economic basis for including you. And this now has, ha has got a knock-on effect on political stability. But what we do know, and I'll speak a little bit about this paradox, is that even though there's a systemic problem, the solutions will come up from the ground. It will be bottom-up. And so to sort of just draw this argument together, globally, but manifesting in different ways between Sweden and African cities, we've got, I think, four main meta challenges. Work for young people and the African labor force will more than treble in just the next 30 years. And, and already we've got that high level of unemployment. Of course, the climate emergency, inequality, which we see is growing and rising both within countries, within cities and between, with some exceptions. And then I think something that is maybe more difficult to grasp, but that is as important as these material questions is meaning. Is what does it mean to be a modern citizen, a citizen of the world, a part of a cosmopolitan family? And what does that meaning, what shape does it take in a context of what one could arguably call runaway consumerism, rising chauvinism rooted in a very particular understanding of modern identities, which equates often individualism. Now, these are all complex, multifaceted problems, and I don't want to suggest that there are simple answers to them. But from a strategic point of view, given the drivers of the inequalities that we face and the nature of the economic exclusionary problems, we know these three levers will, can make a profound and potentially systemic difference. 
focusing on sustainable infrastructure investments, and I'll talk more about that, rethinking the nature of land ownership and the production of value off land, and lastly, enabling reflexive governance and a new generation of regulatory tools. Now, I can't speak to the last two in the short talk, but I want to just reflect that this is a challenge that doesn't just face us on the African continent, but it's a global question, of course. And so we need some kind of dialogue and partnerships between yourselves and us to figure out what are these new forms of living, cultural confidence, work, mobility, connectivity, and well-being that we will have to envision and produce in the way we run and plan and invest in our cities. Of course, given in the context of larger inequality, the, the real big question is, how do we solve this puzzle for 68% of the global population who are currently forced to subsist on only 3% of global wealth, if uh, World Economic Forum data is to be believed? So turning to this question of sustainable infrastructure in the last two minutes, we've developed through a set of conversations to respond to COVID, a provisional set of criteria about what infrastructure investments that in fact can take us in the direction of sustainability um, should, uh, what are the criteria they should meet? And very briefly, they should be low carbon, obviously. They have to be labor intensive because every single investment we make in our settlement system, in our urban system, has got to think about the job multipliers. And that means thinking about the labor capital ratios at all times and always opting for the most labor intensive response. It's got to figure out how to circulate value. And so the debates are on the circular economy and the reimagining and rethinking of placemaking through community-based social infrastructure and social economies is absolutely critical. It's got to be digitally enabled. And I guess this has been the big lesson. It's just what a difference broadband connectivity can make in responding to a pandemic such as COVID. And lastly, it has to consciously address the, the, the land use di dilemmas that we face. It's got to be spatially efficient and just. Now, sort of to build a simpler narrative, we talk about bringing together the care economy and the circular economy enabled by digital platforms and open protocols. And we then try and think, how do we take every single sector that structures the urban environment, that structures our cities, through this lens, whether it's water, whether it's electricity, whether it's public transport and so forth. And what is amazing about this is that if we really drill down through this, we can begin to see the beginnings of a new growth path, a new green industrial strategy that can be anchored in African cities. And so to conclude then, let me just show you this one example from work that has been done by the Toilet Board Coalition in partnership with various actors that brings together the crisis of sanitation, the toilet economy as they call it, and tries to rethink that through the principles of the circular economy to in turn value, to expand economic uh, circularities, but also then enabling both of those through an introduction of the smart economy in a very strategic and pointed way, not losing sight of the dilemmas of affordability and inclusion and so forth. Again, this is a very rich dynamic, but I've run out of time. So just to leave this thought with you, that the work that lies ahead of us is to figure out, as I said, how to reimagine and rebuild our economies on the basis of circularity and care and rethink every single infrastructure and reimagine what the institutional architectures for national, regional, and local governments might be and how our cities on the African continent can take the lead in demonstrating these alternatives. And this would not have been possible a year ago. If we did not have the disruption of COVID, it would not have been possible to have this conversation. I hope that gave you some insight into where our debates on our processes, and I'm very happy to return to any of these questions in the discussion time. Thank you very much.